randomly. So back to what I was saying, though. Uh, Mark Henry in this documentary, he says, I honestly believe God put me on earth to be the strongest man that's ever walked on the earth. And I think there are people like LeBron James, right? Like, I and they actually say it about Brock at, at, at times, too. If you let someone live over that life a million times, they found what their purpose on earth was. And I think Gable Stevenson, you know, supreme athlete, but I think that he has just a natural inclination for the sport of wrestling. And he might be, he might be able to go play pro football at a very high level, but what he was naturally put on earth to do is to wrestle. I've never seen anything like this kid. Like you're talking about someone who wasn't training full time, comes back for the U S open and is tech falling former world medalist. Like it's nothing without training full time. It doesn't make any sense. Like it makes my brain hurt. I, I was telling this, to coach Fit Finley the other day. And maybe I'm a little bit older now. Maybe I'm a little bit more mature now. Uh, you know, I, I wrestled guys that gave Gable a hard time or have wins over Gable, you know, with Nick Wisdowski, uh, you know, Kassar, Derek White. You know, we have common opponents and everything. And I sit back and I look at it and I'm like, even if I beat Gable, I did everything right and I beat Gable, the scary thing is he'd have to just put in a little bit of work and he'd probably be able to hop back over me. Like, he's just that naturally, like, gifted and talented. And it's it's amazing to me. With all that being said, right, like, someone like Michael Jordan. We can argue LeBron. We can argue Michael all day, right? But Michael Jordan is someone who was at the peak of his profession but decided to step away for something else. And was he the greatest baseball player of all time? No, you're talking about a guy that batted 200 in double A. But he wanted to do it, and he still was better than 99% of people that have ever played baseball. And I think Gable Stevenson, you know, the, the wrestling community, both pro wrestling and, you know, Olympic style wrestling have been kind of unfair to him because one, he hasn't gotten a chance to show what he's able to do on the big stage yet. But two, also like, even if he doesn't end up being the greatest of all time in the WWE, like the guy's supremely talented and he went after two dreams and chased them. So it's like, that's a super cool thing. I don't know if, if Gable will be a megastar. I think he's got all the tools to be a megastar. Um, but it is different. Like you said, there's an entertainment value. You can't go out and, you know, short offense, spin behind somebody and put points up here, and, like, people are going to react to that. It's also about the longevity of a character so they can invest in someone. Like, if Superman comes on the scene and just beats everybody up, you don't care about Superman that much. But when you learn about his vulnerabilities and you, you take that ride with him, it matters a little bit more and that there's – millions of comic books right like you have you're more invested because there's so much like backstory with superman and like he's got to be willing i think to give this that time and to let them show who he actually is as a person for people to get invested like that and if he doesn't want to do that and he wants to maul dudes through 2024 and then 2028 i'm all good with that too because it's a lot of fun to watch him on the run that he's on right now it's pretty fun man and it's like the mason paris match and at the u.s open it's just like that's the only time you got a point scored on him, right? Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> that was our Hodge Trophy winner, man. That was our best guy in college wrestling, Paul Verbot. I think Starachi obviously is right there, right? And and um, I think you could have given the 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 Hodge to Starachi or him. Um, Vito's pretty good too, but I mean, it's unreal, man. It's unreal to watch what that guy did to the best. Guy, what he did to was dude, Nick Wisdowski is an all timer, bro. Yeah, Nick two Wisdowski time world medalist, two time, he's two time NCAA champ. He's real good, and, yeah. And honestly, I think had the rules not had the rules be what they should be, he should be a three timer over Snyder, too. In my opinion, that's wild. It's just what one of the all time great matches ever in NCAA finals history. Him and Kyle Snyder was, yeah, Madison Square Garden. So you're what where you want to yep. be, right? It's where you want to be. Main event. Main, main event, event, right? Uh, so, you know, you look at these guys in this era of wrestling, man. It, it's crazy to, to see how good heavyweight has been since the early 2000s, the Stephen Neal era to this current era, right? Like Mason Paris is really good, man. He won the Hodge. And to the point, Gable, Gable beats him up, right? I think that's a credit to Mason Paris is a world champion, an age level world champion. He's really good, man. And it's just, it's an unbelievable heyday. And then like, you can go back to the, even dude, even the, the early nineties, the Kurt Angle era, 
right? The Kurt Angle era, the Sylvester Turquet era, the uh, yeah. John Llewellyn era, right? Uh, uh, hold on. Then you can go back even more and the all-time greatest NCAA wrestler in history, six titles. Rest in peace, Carlton Hasselrig, right? I mean, it's just, it's amazing to think about what we have put on the mat in NCAA wrestling. Are, are they're, they're, they're amazing. What they've done is amazing. We've had NFL guys, lots of NFL guys, and it's just, it's incredible to see what the sport of wrestling really does for those guys at the next level, whatever they choose to do. And that, that's the thing for me when I look at, look where you are now, you know, I love it. I think it's, it's like one of my favorite things to talk about Um, right now. Is it Julius Creed's your name? What is your brother's name? Brutus Creed. Your brother's Brutus Creed. I did not listen. I did not know that even a little bit. Do you have yeah, any? He input? looks like a Brutus. Do you have any input on that? Yeah, you get some say in that. So uh, the process for us, everyone's process is different. Um, that's another thing that people don't understand. Everyone's journey is different. Everyone's process is different. They asked us for names. They said we could either go with the same last name and be brothers or not. We said, obviously, we won't want to be brothers. We, we kind of tackled this journey together. So we submitted our favorite last names and we submitted our favorite first names. And uh, I think Julius was probably my number one first name. But Creed was like fourth or fifth on the last names. Um, but it, that's what they liked and that's what they could get, you know, proper trademark and copywriting on. So but yeah, you don't own that name. you don't own that name. No, sir. That's their name. Like this isn't, uh, that's not, he don't own that. He don't own nope. that. Name. You got, you got one yet? Not yet. No, sir. When you get one of those, I'll put it up here with his. Cause I got like five or six of his in here. And then, oh, oh, look, this is just what's in my, my reach right now. There's a lot going on in this office, bro. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hold on, hold on. Full turtleneck. Oh, there you go. Yeah, the Prism rookie card. How many of these do you, how many how many of these do you have? A lot. <laughs> like well, how many different series do you have? Do you know yet? Uh it's definitely double digits. I mean, at my house Are alone. Serious? Yeah, I probably have a handful of them here. So every once in a while when you do the cards like that, they'll send you like Hey, thank you for signing so many cards or whatever, and they give you some of them back. So I probably have five stacks of my own here that are different, like editions or I don't, I'm not good with all the cards. There's but tractors, there's prisms, there's chrome, yeah. there, there's all these different. Yeah, like dude, like he's got hundreds of cards. He Nick, oh, had, yeah. he has hundreds of cards. You know, and he's been at it so long. I got his rookie card around here when that when he was that bad. When he was the Nikki, when he was the Spirit Squad, yeah. Um, I actually got to hang out with him. Um, in two thousand eight, my sister in law won. Ian's mom, my brother Ferd's wife, won a trip, an all paid expense trip, to Disney in Florida. <laughs> Nick lived in Tampa, and I went down and met him like on our last night when we were there. I hung out all week next to the pool, drank beer. It was awesome. We went to Disney a couple of days, Cirque du Soleil. Ian was taunting uh, the alligators. My nephew Ian was taunting the alligators and ch letting them chase him around. Real thing, not making it up. He's out of his mind. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. He's he's not, yeah. Anyhow, I went down to Tampa when Nick lived down there. What was the league then when he was in it? Florida Championship Wrestling? FCW, yeah. And it was right after the Nikki from the Spirit Squad transitioning into Dolph Ziggler. And um, he was dating this girl named Nikki. Uh, uh, do you know who Nikki is? Yeah. Nikki Bala. And I was like, who's this? And we hung out. We went to these outdoor bars and it was cool. And we had a good time. And then at the end of the night, I was like, oh, yeah, what do you do? Like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, my twin sister and I are in this. And Oh, that's cool. And she was a super nice, very nice. Hung out the whole night with them. And then we went to uh, Chipotle. I got the double burrito. He got the double chicken. Back to the house, went to sleep, flew home. The next thing I know, three months later, they're both getting huge pushes. They're in. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So I'll send you the picture that I got with them at the uh, that's funny. outdoor cabana bar we were at. And I frequently tweeted at him and John Cena, hashtag Mr. Steal Your Girl. You'll like it. <laughs> you'll like it 
You yeah. like? I think, I think I'm wearing this actual hat, this literal hat in the picture. That exact one. It might actually be. That's funny. You'll see. You'll see the picture. Um, your brother and you. How much do you like working with your brother? And 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 what's the journey like for you and your brother? And are they pretty adamant about keeping you guys together? And or or do you see what? Where do you guys go from here? Do you think? Um, we'll do whatever the company wants. Uh, I think that's kind of where we're at. I think that we feel, and they probably realize that you're going to have a very hard time finding two genetically related brothers with as much chemistry and as much, um, entertainment value as we probably bring. So I think that's, uh, a very enticing thing for the company to keep together right now. But if the time comes where they want us to, to run separate, or if he gets on my nerves too much, which sometimes he does, you know, it might be time to beat the crap out of him. Uh, maybe <laughs> Julius turns on Brutus before Brutus stabs uh, Julius in the back, like old uh, Roman times. But we'll, we'll see. You know, I don't know what they're, they're planning for us. Um, we're going to control what we can control. We're going to work as hard as we can. We're going to be ready for whatever. As far as working with my brother, it is some of the best times and it is some of the most damn frustrating times also. Uh There'll be times where I'm like, hey, I think we need to do this. And I'm saying, hey, we need to go to the left. And he's saying, no, we need to go to the right. And I just want to reach over and, and beat him up. There's been a couple of times where we've almost come to blows. And it, it gets – and, man, it feels like you're, you're like little kids again because then we're called into the office and we're told, hey, you guys can't be about to fight. It happened a couple of times now where we, we've almost come to blows. And it's like – it's great, though, you know, that – I, I told this to the group of guys that we came in with. I came in with a group of guys, uh, Joe Ariola, who wrestled at Buffalo. He's Tony D'Angelo. On I know who now. Joe Ariola, 197 for Buffalo. Yep. Matrick Belton, he played uh, for South Carolina football and then also for the Eagles. Uh, he's Trick Williams now. Uh, Bronson Reichsteiner, uh, Rick Steiner's son, who uh, wrestled at Georgia, was a state champ in Georgia, and then uh, played football at Kennesaw State. Uh, and then my brother and I. We came in together in the small class, and we learned to wrestle in a warehouse in front of anybody, in front of nobody. And then our first time ever professionally wrestling in front of anybody was on live TV, and that's unprecedented. That's something that no one else outside of our group is ever going to be able to relate to, and that's a really cool experience. I feel bonded to those guys, right? But as close as I am to those guys, I shared a bunk bed with my brother. You know, I have 20 plus years of backstory. I can give him a look sometimes and he knows what I'm thinking or he can give me a nudge and I know where he needs me to go and stuff. And like, as much as people want to say they're best friends, as much as people want to spend time together at the end of the day, that's great. You could live together for the next 20 years. So your time is equal with ours. But then at the end of the day, the blood that's coursing in our veins, we're genetically going to be a little bit closer no matter what. So I think, you know, like I said, there's a lot of money in what it's to be made right now. I've got to experience some of the coolest things. You know, first person he called when his NCAA tournament was canceled was me. The person that he ran off the mat after beating Jack Harris from Urbana for winning the D2 uh, state title was me because I flew up to surprise him. He wanted to find me out of everybody. And we, we haven't always had the closest relationship. But now that we're adults and we get to experience things together, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot closer. And he also has shown a little bit more of an appreciation for what I've done for him and uh, the family at this point. Cause I, I do think it takes someone willing to break the mold. And if you ask me, you know, all American finishes, ACC title, Olympic trials placement, you know, state placement, whatever it is, what my greatest accomplishment in life is, you know, WWE tag titles at one point, everything that we're going to accomplish. And I could sit there and I could tell you without a shadow of a doubt, it's what my brothers have accomplished. And what they've done and I, and just how proud of them I really am to watch my older brother turn his life away or to turn his life around the way he has and to watch my little brother grow and to be able to succeed the way he has like those are the best things I've done with my life so to be able to take this journey with him is so damn cool and it's so fun right now and you know it might come a point in time where it runs its course and I'm ready to kill him and it comes out time to time right now but for now, this is what we want to do. This is how we're going to do it. Um, but it's about the most special thing you could do. And, you know, I know my parents are damn proud of that, too. So it's really, really fun, and it's really, really cool right now. Do you guys still train at all um, any type of amateur wrestling? Like, I know you like to just work out. Do you guys ever just drill? Do you ever just drill? Do you ever wrestle, like, like 
like a college match, a freestyle match. Do you do that anymore? Is it all taking bumps, learning moves, choreography, and working together and working in the ring? Is it all ring work, or does there have any wrestling anymore? So uh, Amateur wrestling. Court- amateur wrestling. Is there any amateur wrestling anymore? I got you. When 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 I fell short of my state title, um, and I thought how bad that hurt, I would go back and I would I would put it on him, like I would put it on him bad, because I knew how bad that hurt, and I didn't want him to experience that. That created like a wedge in our relationship. He would come down for a couple weeks at a time to wrestle with me at Duke, but he didn't want to be around me full time, just because like in the wrestling room, I'm I'm different. Like when we're out there, it's it's time to do it. So that being said. No, he, he 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 knows where uh, we lie on the totem pole there. So he he doesn't really want to – we'll drill occasionally or we'll roll around every once in a while, um, but it's never like full-blown go anymore. Uh, there are a couple people at work. I'll do this thing. Sometimes I call it a uh, fight club. I'll let all the new guys line up and try to take me down, and I'll go two hours. I'll just let them rotate on me and see if anybody can. They can't. Like, you down? Are you joking? Oh, I mean, there are guys that have wrestled at a high level. We got PA State placers and guys that wrestle, but like they're they're not touching me. And like the other thing is, I don't get tired. I never have. So like I'm gonna go for two hours straight, and they can all rotate on me. But like we'll get over there. I'll drill with uh, Tony D every once in a while. We actually had a phone call today about it. Like we need to start doing it more because that gets you in the best shape. But no, uh, Gabe Dean came down in 2020, and I rolled with him and uh, Cornell at the time, and. I was like, dang, I still got it. And then Stanford came down this year, and I rolled with them. And I was like, man, I still got it. Uh, and then Mock came down in January, and I did some jujitsu with Mock, and I beat him up. And uh, I'm like, I missed that. I missed that a lot. But in terms of getting out there and scrapping, no. The one person I wouldn't mind getting hands on, though, is Gable. I see him around from time to time. I just want to feel what that's like, you know. Like, I, I want his feet are so fast. The short offense is so good. Like, I just want to see what that's like one time. It is it is incredible to watch. Um, what he did to the Akul guy and Petrushvili, uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe it, dude. I want him and the Iranian guy so bad. I yeah. think he is going to slaughter that guy. I think that guy will push him early on. I think he's just too – I think he just – he moves so different than everybody, dude. He moves it's, it's crazy, so right? You're, you're talking Mason Paris is the Hodge Trophy winner. But, like, on top of it, like, you look at the the ski, the ski like the landscape of the world. I think Mason Paris is a world medalist. I think well, Nick he is. Because he, he is. He yeah. is. Because he is. Gwiz like, is a world medalist. Because they're, they're world medalists. Like, you can say, like, Carter Sirachi, I think he's amazing. I think he's great. I think he gives a very entertaining interview. But, like, he's not even cracking our team right now. Like, he's not even maybe top three on the depth chart, let alone like bringing home a serious medal or winning it. But you have guys at heavyweight. I'm confident if you send Mason Paris over there, if you send Gwizdowski, we got medal and title contenders. And Gable Stevenson's just blowing them out of the water. It, it, it's it like, makes no it's sense. insane. It's insane to watch because he's just like, he's at a different speed than them. Yeah. Like I said, I think I some people were – Find what they're put on the earth to do, and I think that this is what he was put on earth to do. Do you want you want the smoke? You want to feel the Gable Stevenson smoke. Zeb, when I walked out senior year, Cleveland, Quicken Loans Arena or whatever it is now, sold out semifinals. They're holding up 430 or whatever, because that's how long it was gonna be to get back from commercial break. I'm out there. I'm in my T-shirt. It said, you know, finally the ghost has come back to Cleveland or whatever. I'm wrestling <laughs> Kyle Snyder, the Ohio State guy. ESPN is following me around for like an article for the WWE and because they think I could possibly pull this upset. I am Crohn's disease sick. Like everything stacked against me on paper, right? Like nothing makes sense. And as I'm slapping my coach's hands, I said, you're going to tell your kids about this. I'm about to shock the world. I proceeded to lose. But even in that moment, I 100% was convinced that nobody on earth could beat me. And to this day, anytime that I've got to compete at anything, I believe I am the best guy in the world. I will always put the chips on myself. I, Daniel Cormier, when I lived with DC, he said, hey, can you give me some rounds tomorrow? I said, yeah. This is like, uh, this would have been like a Tuesday night. So I'm going to bed in this guy's house. I'm sleeping in this guy's house on his dime out there helping him get ready for the world heavyweight title fight with Steve Miocic. 
I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm going to beat the piss out of this guy tomorrow. I'm going to beat him up. I've never fought. I've never sparred rounds. I've never done anything. But I'm fully convinced as I'm laying under this man's roof that I'm going to go in the next day and I'm going to beat him up. And I, I believed it with every fiber of my being. I proceeded to get the crap kicked out of me. But like, even that, you know, I would rather find the truth out and fully believe in myself. I am never going to bet against myself. I want to feel what Gable Stevenson feels like. I love your supreme confidence. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm being serious. Like, I love your supreme confidence. I love that you're a two time Ohio State placer. I love that you believed you could beat Kyle Snyder. I love that you thought you could beat Kyle Snyder twice. The second NCAA semifinal was much closer than the first. Let's get that out of the way. Yeah. If I didn't have to get – if I didn't get ID that morning and I was healthy, I would still to this day believe I would beat Kyle Snyder. Six, what was it, 6-3 in that second one? I don't remember, to be honest. It was – at some point in the second, I got a takedown and I was up. That's all. I, and then, you know, the wheels fell off. But <laughs> He's good. Pretty good. He's pretty good. Uh, the transition – Compare a, uh, an amateur wrestling season. D give me a, okay. Here's the thing we got to clarify. Don't give me a 184 wrestling season. Give me a heavyweight wrestling season. Because we know that a 184, you'll never do anything like those 184 seasons ever again in your life. It was hell. Those are the probably the hardest things besides being a father and a husband that you're ever going to do. Those are the things that are only like comparable to that, right? Um, sounds like that's the direction you're going father, father and uh, husband, right? Right. Yeah, I, I would think so. I hope so. Okay. Those, sometimes those things get difficult, but those 184 seasons, I don't think there's anything you can do right now, even in WWE overtraining, taking bumps 300 nights a week, which it's insane. I didn't say that they could, I didn't say that they perform 300 nights a week, 300 nights a year. I said that they travel. Right. That's what I said when I said it earlier. I meant they travel, which travel means you're not at your home, right? So, so that I don't think they do that to you guys as much anymore, do they? No, I think it's it's a much more family friendly uh, company, and, and and that's in relation to like the partying and stuff too. Like the culture has completely changed because you look at all those guys; they struggled. Like I think, you know, Dolph, you know, Nick, whatever you want to call them, and that whole group kind of changed the culture in that way, where you see a lot more family friendly like body conscious people okay so the 184 seasons you're never going to experience anything like that again and once again here's here, these are tangents i get but the reason are you are our guys are so good in bellator professional fight league one fc ufc is you did 20 weigh-ins that year you made the ncaa tournament at 184 you did 20 weigh-ins that year on one hour for dual meets so half of those were over half were dual meets. And then you did five, six tournament weigh-ins, right? You do more weigh-ins in a season than most MMA fighters do in a career. I want you yeah. to think about that. And you're doing them on one hour for, for dual meets, two hours for a tournament. So I don't think there's anything we can ever compare to your 184 seasons. No. Your heavyweight seasons where you could eat drink all you want and just go out and wrestle perform compare those seasons to these NXT um, years that you've been in. Um, and, and what sense just the preparation grueling, or grueling preparation, um, travel, any of it. Give me the full, how easy is it to make the transition from D one wrestling, Greco Roman wrestling to, uh, what are, what are all your guys' current leagues? NXT, and then you have another one, don't you? Yeah. Uh, what, like Raw and SmackDown on the main roster. Yeah, okay. So you got NXT, main main roster, Raw, SmackDown, right? What is that right. What is that transition like from an NCAA season to working a full year as a WWE athlete? Uh, you know, it's different in a lot of ways, um, but it's the same in a lot of ways. So, like, you know that moment in practice or that moment in a match where your your blood's pumping, your heart's bump, 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 your lungs are burning, your stomach's churning, the room's spinning, like, but you know you got to keep going and you got to push through that uncomfortable. You 
you get that same kind of uncomfortable uh physically no but like when i go out there and i gotta grab a mic and i gotta entertain i'm not like a super extroverted dude you and i have chemistry i think in interviews because like i know you're an ohio guy i'm comfortable with you but like when i when i first get to any job when i first get to any wrestling room or whatever it is i'm pretty standoffish at the jump so like that gives me that rush that adrenaline rush that thrill of competing and like in the college wrestling season right it's monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday get to compete get to live your dream sunday monday tuesday wednesday thursday and now it's right now it's tuesdays and then hopefully at some point it's mondays for monday night raw or fridays right now my weeks revolve around tuesdays so it's like tuesday and then wednesdays are kind of like my sunday recovery get ready again day thursday i'm getting ready to go again like starting to gear up into it so it's super similar in a lot of ways uh are the workouts as hard no what we physically did you know, whether you were making heavyweight or whether you were making 84, I don't think there's anything as physically challenging. I've got a college teammate who was, sorry, Mike, he sucked. He was so awful. <laughs> and um, he uh, got beat up all the time at practice. He's a Navy SEAL now. And he called oh, me and he told me, like, what we did what we did in college wrestling was way harder than anything he's done in Navy SEALs. No uh, way. Yeah. So, what, like, what's, I, Mike's I What's Mike's name? What's Mike's name? Uh, I don't. I don't know if I'm allowed to say his last name because of him okay, being. Well, don't. You can figure fine. it out. Yeah, I'm sure I could go look on the roster and figure it out, dude. Yeah, exactly. But Mike was not good, and Mike called me and he's like, "Dude, come do this. Like, you would crush it. You used to crush the workouts. Everything we do here is easier than what we did in college." So I don't believe there's anything. I, I've been, like I said, part of Daniel Cormier's fight camps for World Championship fights. Nothing compared to a college season. I believe. A college season is the hardest physical test that anyone can go through. I do believe that. Um, this job has other challenges. The travel, uh, you know, I read some quote the other day. It's like the, the true thing of loneliness is like when people are around, but nobody understands you or whatever. Like there's loneliness in this job. I thank God every day that I got a brother here so he can understand me a little bit better. Like, but a lot of people don't understand what you're going through. Like there's other challenges in that way. Um, where, like I said, on a college wrestling team, you feel like you got your guys, you got your boys, you all got each other's backs. You're walking into that duel or that tournament ready to fight together, uh, where that's not always the case here because it's kind of dog eat dog. Um, but it's similar in some ways, but it's uh, different in others. And I would say that in terms of physically physical demand, there's nothing that's ever going to compare to a college wrestling season that any of us will go through in life. Thank you. That. That is, I want people to understand that a D1, a D2, a D3, NAIA, JUCO season is literally, dude, the, the high school seasons are super long, man. Like, if you're on wow, these there. now, it is, dude, it's brutal. Like, how long and how many weigh-ins are insane. The amount well, let's, of let's talk about this, though. I just had this conversation with my brother. Let's talk about this because you're a guy – and this is part of the reason I respect and appreciate you so much, right? right? Is like, you know, my job's a little bit different, but I can imagine time away from home Monday to Friday, you know, whether you're a school teacher at, at Riverside or whatever it is, you spend all that time away from your family and you spend all that time at a job regardless, right? And then you get Saturday and Sunday off and you spend, my parents would, would go to work. My mom was a school teacher, special education teacher at Cardington and then couple other schools and she would take us to school go to school pick us up from a practice take us to another practice sometimes take us to another practice come home cook for us put us to bed would wake up and do it again 18 plus you know my older brother was two years my younger brother was two years you're talking about 22 years that woman did not have a day to herself and she worked relentlessly at that my dad was the same way my dad worked ups nine to five worked hard and then every single weekend, you know, when they weren't taking us to practices, they were on bleacher seats watching wrestling. Like, I can't imagine the little bit of free time you do. Like, you commit it to the sport. You're going to commit it to being a great parent. You're going to commit it to taking to your kids. Like, like you said, like, college wrestling is a grind. The high school wrestling season is a grind. You know, workouts and then competitions. Like, it's not fan-friendly being in a high school gym all day or whatever gym it is. But 
what you're going to do with your son, like, I would imagine that's got to be the only thing that's going to kind of rival, you know, mentally and physically, like taking that emotional ride with him when, when he's making those trips and you get to watch him achieve a dream or come up short, like that's going to probably be the only thing that will rival it in my mind. I'm not a father yet, so I don't know. That is, that's a big part of it right now. I mean, my kids are only five and seven, but like seeing them figure things out and I don't know if they're going to wrestle. Like right now they're real, like eh, this maybe not before us, you know, for, for them played uh, uh basketball this last year. And I was like, Hey, Hey man, if you want to, uh, we love basketball. I, I keep telling people this story. We love basketball and it's this, they have a K through 12 campus where he's at. And then they have like this bus garage and this like adult education building. It's an old elementary school. And then Kenston's campus is up on a hill. So I cut through Kenston to get to our house. Um, and he, we're driving from basketball practice and we go up by the wrestling room. We see coach Jeff Varney, you know, Jeff, Jeff's a shoe guy. Yeah. Jeff Varney, he, hate, he, hate. he hates a great yeah. guy. And he, you know, he lives two miles down the road. Um, he goes, dad, are we going to wrestling practice? And I was like, no, man, you said basketball. And he's like, oh, I'm like, do you want it? He's like, no, I don't want to go. And I was like, well, we're not going. And then I, at that point, I was just like, hey, man, if you don't ever want to go in that room again, you don't have to. It's up to you. I said, but if you want to murder everybody in football, you want to be the best baseball player, and you want to be able to outrun everybody and be the best at whatever you do in life, that's where you need to be. And he just, like, kind of took it in. And I was like, okay. But I think that it just offers so much, man. It just offers so much. Like I have a nephew who placed in the state tournament this year. I think he did it for my brother, but right now he's knocking on the door, man. He's going to have a great, uh, he's going to make a run. At, I think he can be a top three guy in the 400 meters this year. Right. He was 10 yeah. last year in D2. Like all that stuff's from wrestling. He's going to be a sub 48, maybe a 47, 400 guy. That's Dude, fast. He had a 49, four last week in their league. He's fast. You That's know what I mean? fast. Uh, other <laughs> nephew was a state qualifier this year, a freshman. Ran a 202-800. So, you know, and, and and their toughness and where they're getting a lot of it from, they weren't the Blaze brothers. They're not the Blaze brothers, right? But they're tough, and they give it all they got, and they're learning that. all the lessons from it, and they're cutting the weight when they don't want to cut the weight, and they're doing the things they have to do. And think about what more it's doing for them in life. That's the thing I don't think people get. You don't always have to be a state champ. I, I think that that, God, oh, you're not. St I'm still of all my three, four brothers. I'm the only one who's not a state champ. All my brothers are state champ. I got two nephews that are state champs, right? Um, I, I'm, I, look, I'm most proud of my nephews winning. Like, look, dude, look at this. This is when my one nephew won. That was like one of my happiest moments I've ever been. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. That's the best, hey, right? I, there's my brother Chad. There's my brother Chad winning his state title, right? Here's my nephew Bodie. He's tougher than a two dollar steak. But like those are the things I'm most proud of. When those guys achieve something, that's the hat because I got a great relationship and bond with them. They're awesome people. Like what you said, you're proudest of your brothers, right? That's your proudest moments. And my yeah. proudest moments are when they can achieve and they're ever better than I was. I want to see them be better than me. I want my kids to be better than me. I want everybody. That's awesome. But like when I told my kid, I was just like, you want to be the best at everything? You're going to get it done in that room right there. Dude. I think what your kids are going through is normal. And it's like something we actually talked about. Uh, uh, again, Joe Ariola, me, my younger brother, and then Bronson Steiner. We had this conversation recently. So Rick Steiner was an All-American at Michigan, right? He obviously wanted his son to wrestle and to be good at wrestling. Uh, you know, Joe's dad was, you know, a football player, but also wanted him to wrestle. He, he wrestled for OPRF, uh, Mike Powell and everything. Really? And we all had the same conversation. And, you know, you, you said you're telling everyone the basketball story. Well, I'm going to tell you a story that I haven't told anyone. Uh, my brother and I got in a fight when we were real young. Probably, uh, so it would have been, I was at least in sixth grade. I was probably in seventh or eighth grade. And I was playing baseball full time. And I thought which, I was going to be a really brother? good baseball player. Which brother? My younger brother. Yeah, true. And when we would fight, we would get, we would do real petty stuff. He would, like, he didn't want to square up anymore because I was starting to get bigger. But, um. He would like go in my room and break a trophy or something. Ooh. And then I would go and break something of his. And then he would cross out my picture or something on a family photo. He'd do real petty stuff like that. So I said, all right. So I took his like prized medal where he was like uh, 
all American at what is it? It's whatever's b- below schoolboy for USA Wrestling. Um, he was like an all American at that. Yeah, and uh, stuck novice. That's exactly what it was. I stuck it in a bar of deodorant, <laughs> and he took it to my dad. Right? Because like that that won the that won the pettiness. He took it to my dad. My dad called me down and he said, "Did you do this because you're jealous and you can't win it? He, like you can't win this yourself." And that that lit a fire under me like nothing else. Like I said, I'm petty and I keep a chip on my shoulder. And that was the day that I decided I was going to wrestle full time. And you know, I, I tell people a lot of the time it's because I wasn't big enough to play baseball. I'm sure that was part of it. At the time, I didn't think I was going to get big enough. My dad kept telling me, "Keep playing, you'll grow by your senior year." But it was that. And I look back at that. None of us wanted to wrestle is why I mentioned those other guys at the start. You know, Joe told me he didn't want to wrestle. Bronson told me he didn't want to wrestle. But even when we did other things, when I played baseball and I played at a high level, my dad was proud of me. But when I won in wrestling, it was it was different. And they said the exact same thing. Like they were good at football. They were good at all this. But when they won in wrestling, you know, whether their dad's meant to or not, if you've done it, you understand what it takes. So, like, you're going to be a little bit more proud of your your nephews, your brothers, whatever it is, because of the sport of wrestling. And they sense that with their dads. And at the end of the day, as much as none of us wanted to do it, we all did it. We all did it at a high level. And we don't regret it at all because of exactly what you said, of the who it makes you. And, like, Coach Lanham used to say this all the time at the end of practices. He's like, I'm not coaching you right now for March. I'm not coaching you for an All-American finish or an NCAA title. I'm call, I'm coaching you for when you get a phone call that your wife, that your mom, that your dad is sick or that they're dying or that they died and they're not able to keep going and that you need to be the family man that everyone relies on. I'm coaching you to be able to push through those hard moments. And he would tell us stuff like that, that he was getting us ready for life. And like, there's nothing else. Like you said, there's nothing else. Whether it's running, a, you know, we can, we can go off on a tangent of 400 and 800. They're probably the most difficult races to run, right? Because they're not a sprint. And they're not a distance run. They're sprinting a distance run. It's like the most difficult thing to do. You have to be tough. You have to maintain that speed over a, a longer distance. And like, but it's the exact same thing, you know, whether it's, it's getting you tough to run a race, whether it's getting you tough to run the marathon that is life. Like, you know, my older brother, I've never told this story either. My older brother's ready to go for military selection. He's going to a elite, elite unit, uh, special forces. And What turned his life around, he's stocking vending machines, chronic underachiever in life, stocking vending machines, and living with my parents. And he says, Jerry Briscoe comes to watch me at my senior night goal. I said, I actually got a brother that wants to do WWE with me. I'm talking about Drew, my younger brother. He says, yeah, Greg, I met him. Super charismatic. I said, (laughs) no, not Greg. I said, not Greg. Greg is smaller. Greg is not interested in WWE. But Briscoe said, yeah, Greg, yeah, I got you guys both booked for the tryout already. So I, I get a hold of Greg after that duel. I said, dude, you cannot embarrass me when we go down for that. At the time, like I said, nothing wrong with that profession, but he's stocking a vending machine. He's living at home with my parents. He's older than me. Like His life was just not going the way that it could with the potential that he had. And he said, all right, don't worry about it. I got you. I'm going to lock in. And he woke up. He worked out every day. He worked out after work. He comes down. He did really well at the tryout, but, you know, it's just not his thing. And I knew it wasn't his thing, like, before we even got into it. And he goes home. He's like, man, if they call, I'm accepting the offer and stuff. And, like, I had to make a call. I said, Greg, like, man, they already told me, like, they're hiring me. Like, if you were getting hired, you'd know. He was crushed. I could tell. He calls me back, like, a day or two later after he's reflected on it. He said, I- I'm going all in on my, my life dream. I'm going to go special forces. He said, will you help me get ready for it? I said, yeah, whatever you need. He said, write me a program. So I write this program for him to train to get ready. Um, I'm starting to coach at this point. And I said, like, look, the thing about this program, though, is, Greg, you're not doing this at 530 in the afternoon when you get off work. You're going to do this when you don't want to do it. And what that means in Ohio is 330 in the morning in January when there's ice on the roads and ice on the streets. Like, you're going to go outside and you're going to do these runs. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. He said, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And at this point, you know, he had never fully committed to anything. And he commits to it. And it's getting closer to the date for him to ship out. And he calls me and he says, man, you know, I don't know. that They have this thing at the end of it where you got to put a a rucksack on and you got to ruck 
anywhere from like 26 to 29 miles. I said, all right, whatever. He said, yeah, but you got to do it in under 10 hours. I said, all right, cool. He said, yeah, but you got to do it with 75 pounds on your back. I said, Greg, when you get there, you just got to make the decision, right? This is either going to kill me or I'm going to get through it. But you got to be willing to go to that extreme. He said, it's not that easy. Well, I said, look, dude, I've been coaching, haven't really been training. I said, but I know right now off the couch, I could do it because I would make myself because I'm tough enough. No, you couldn't. Yes, I could. No, you couldn't. Yes, I could. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'm going to do it. So I go to a military surplus store and I buy the bag. And I FaceTime. Hey, dude, what do I need to do to do this? All right. Well, you need to put 70 pounds in it. You need to do this. I get on a scale with it. Show them it's 70 pounds. All right. Yeah, I'd like to see you try. I walk a mile in it. I'm like, damn, this thing is heavy. This is going to be harder than I thought. But I needed a trial run before because it's going to take all day. I had to do it on a Saturday uh, when I was coaching Monday to Friday. Cool, whatever. So it's getting closer. That was like a Wednesday or whatever. Thursday, he calls me. Hey, man, just so you know, we have to do it in military boots. So if you don't do it in military boots, it doesn't count. Dude, I don't have military boots. So I get on Amazon. I said, send me whatever military boots you have. He sends it to me. I get on Amazon. I overnight them there the next day. They're brand new boots. I wake up at like 4.45 on a Saturday in North Carolina. It's just me. And one other dude on the team said he wanted to try it. It was one of the fine silvers. So I throw this rucksack on and I position it so my halfway point is Coach Whistle's house. So when I get to Coach Whistle's house, I'm like, yo, this dude is a tough dude. He would not let me quit. So I, I start going three or four miles in. These brand new boots are not broken in. My boots oh. fill up with blood from blisters oh. that pop. And I take my feet up with duct tape and I just put them back on. I start going. I get to Coach Whistle's house way past the uh, halfway point of the time. I'm probably like three hours in. And I've already done 14 miles or 14 and a half miles. I'm killing it. I'm like jogging with the 70 pounds on me. But that whole back half, I was like delirious, man. Like, you know, that feeling in a wrestling room where you got to push back a little bit longer. I oh, yeah. push for like five hours of doing that. And I get to the point where I got I to gotta pee. But I feel so bad. Like I just open up the bottom of my shorts and pee out of the bottom of my shorts. It's like, I couldn't even stop. Like, dude, I was so messed up on this thing. You but were locked in back. though. You're locked I told in. Him I was going to do it. I told him I was going to do it. And it, I, the toughness of wrestling got me to push through that. And I got home and I call him and I, I documented on like, you know, I maps or whatever. So he can see that I actually did it. And I showed him my feet. They were busted up and everything else. I said, you can do it. I did it without training. I did it coming off the couch. You can do it. And he said, all right, I can do it. He left a week and a half or two weeks later, and he ended up making it through. But again, if it wasn't for the toughness that wrestling, like, put me through that, and, you know, I tell that story, one, because I was a tough SOB to do that, and two, I'm proud of my brother for doing it, too. But without wrestling, none of that's possible. Like, wrestling is everything for me and my family. Like, everything we do and everything we have and everything we fall back on is because of this. It's the greatest sport in the world. There's no doubt about it. It's just no. It's it's not up for debate for me, man. It's like we're almost like snobs. Do you realize that? We're almost like snobs. We're almost like elitist about how good our sport is. But like the proof is in look at everybody in the world who's a wrestler. L listen to Joe Rogan talk about wrestlers. Yeah, he, he understands combat sports, right? He's the head announcer for the UFC. He watches the, the top mixed martial arts league. And he understands that wrestling is just different. It's different. If you want to talk about, if you want to be a Brazilian jiu-jitsu world champion, wrestle. You know, it's like people who are just doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, wrestle. Wrestle. You want to feel like a different pace? Uh, wrestle. Try and wrestle. Um, it was, it was, uh, Ryan Lang was over here this weekend. Um. Ryan Lang, not Which Ryan, Ryan Lang, Lang. St. Edward Ryan Lang, Northwestern Ryan Lang. Okay. And he's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And he was explaining Brazilian jiu-jitsu to someone who was over at my house. And he's like, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is more, uh, it's methodical. It's more of a chess match and it's not as fast paced and it's strangleholds and joint manipulation, essentially tapping people out. Right. Well, right. dude, if you sent most D1 college wrestlers and you put them into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they're going to be a lead at it right away because they understand the holds and their pace is almost too fast, right? 
It's like they can just get somebody really tired if they can avoid getting tapped out. That's the problem. Though. Getting, get, you know, getting, so they're really good at getting your joint, manip- manipulating your joint and choking you out, right? Like right. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is like, right? It's methodical. It's just very different, but like wrestlers can be elite at it pretty quick. I think you could probably be pretty elite at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and within a year. Don't you? Yeah. Well, you know who Nikki Rod is, right? Of course. Yeah, Nikki was down here recently, and I was like talking to him about it and just feeling different positions. Uh, I don't do jujitsu regularly at all, and I was just like, "What do you think, man?" After feeling or whatever, he's like, "Dude, six months, you could be one of the best in the world." Like, yeah, well, yeah. but it's because I, but, of the foundation, the groundwork. Yeah, but but Gordon Ryan's not going to be a top eight guy in our in our. He's never going to make the. He's never going to make the world team. He's not going to be in the last tournament. The last chance tournament. He's never going to be that, right? But Bo yeah. Nickel, if he don't dedicates a year of his life to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, he's going to be one of the best in the world. You yeah, get I'm ready point, for Bo right? Nickel. Am I wrong? No, you're hundred. I, I think you're right. Yeah, and but you know maybe it's kind of back to that elitist uh, confidence though that we also have. I think you yeah. have to have that yeah. to be high level in the sport. Like I said, you know, I still still am betting on myself against Gable Steveson right now. I I thought I was going to beat Snyder, like. I think there's a little bit of that, that confidence of being a high level guy you have to have. Like you have to have it. And that swagger, that confidence sends you into a business meeting to be successful, sends you into a jujitsu match to be successful. Like it's I think it's not just pummeling and having underhook and body control and good conditioning. Like I think it's the total package like that the sport gives you. Like it's yeah. the best, man. Yes. But like I think that the wrestlers are able to transition over to Brazilian jiu-jitsu way easier than a Brazilian jiu-jitsu elite person can transition over to wrestling because wrestling, you, who jumps into wrestling late in life, really? Think about it. Nobody. No, it's not. It's, We've done it's it. not no, an man. enjoyable thing. <laughs> For, nothing about it is enjoyable. Like, even as a, a parent or a spectator, like we were talking about, you're in a gym, your weekend, the entire time to watch your kid compete. Like, it's crazy. Okay. Dude, we have covered everything. What have I missed? What do you have for me that I did not ask you or talk about that you want to talk about? I will talk about anything. I'll, let me. I wanted to show you because we were talking about some of this stuff. I'm gonna take you off this deal. My lighting's not gonna be as good. Can I flip this camera? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah. There. There's that on the wall. Chris Moore, Brandon O'Neill, Brandon Taylor. See. That was the year that they did that. And then you were talking about how you got your guys' action figures. So I thought that was funny. I got my guys' action I figures. I have that. DC and Ron Breaker. <laughs> okay. You want to see my real guy? You want to see who I grew up just the all-timer? You want to see the real? Are you ready? Yeah. Let's see it. Oh, Kevin Randleman? Dude. I, I, I'm – that's a Sandusky guy, Zeb. Now dude, you're talking my language. Dude, they didn't make him better than that guy. I got a Coleman, and then I got a Fremont guy up here. Got the hammer. Hey, he followed me on house. Instagram. I was so excited when Mark Coleman followed me on Instagram. <laughs> hey, sober sober life is cool. Hammer house for life. That's his yeah. two hashtags, right? The, the, uh, that the liver king deal. Yeah, yeah, good for yeah, he's doing the he's doing the primal. Oh, oh. Oh, there you go. That's him versus Bart Chelsevig in the NCAA semifinals. Dude, these are autographed. He died the night that Ferdinand was born. Him and my kid passed in the night. My kid was coming in. Kevin was on his way out. That's and crazy. Awesome guy. I got to hang out with him a couple times in Vegas. Obviously, I remember growing up as a kid, going to the Ohio State, went to the 93 Big Ten Championships where he beat Ray Brinzer. What a what a just electrifying, unbelievable freak of nature, man. Oh. So what I wear out in the ring, I wear like the – Oh, yeah, like, you got Barbarian, right? Yeah, and compression shorts, right? Barbarian does my comp- compression shorts a lot of the time. Near Falls done a couple sets of them too, but Barbarian's done – you know, Josh has really, really hooked it up, and I appreciate that. But it's inspired by what Coleman and Randleman used to wear out there. It's like knee pads, wrestling shoes, which just compression shorts, and they just go out and beat people up in that. And, like, I love that. Like, that's what I want my persona and personality to be. Like, I love that stuff. Ohio guys, too, right? And you're an Ohio guy. Okay. Yeah, I got these. 
there you're oh, asking about the car that's what i gotta get dude i gotta send you these see there's another edition dude, you're doing them. a claw lift that was a claw lift yeah yeah that i i dunked uh nebels at ncaa's with dude, i still hit the sick. exact same yeah the exact same claw lift i'm up in a high crotch in this one dude you got a lot so, of so are those all you yeah the, yeah, these, that's a stack of my stuff. So it's interesting, right? Like, I guess something to talk about then would be like my finishing move. I was telling somebody about this at work today, the, the sequence that we have as like my finishing move here in the WWE. And it's funny because I took it from two wrestlers separately. Uh, you remember when Dan Henderson fought Bisbing and he knocks him out and then he hits him with the second shot? Yep. So that's kind of where like my clothesline came from when they're sitting, da uh, sitting down. And then what sets it up is that cartwheel double. You remember the one year, I think it was junior world team trials. It was Mark Hall, Alex Marinelli. And Mark Hall picked up Alex Marinelli and he's running him off the mat. And he like, he basically cartwheeled with him and he pogo sticked his own head. Yeah. And like, it was the craziest thing. I'm like, dude, I wonder if I can do that safely. And that's how I started hitting the cartwheel double. Like everything I do, dude, is still just things that I used to do when I wrestled. Like I'm just doing it now on a, a different stage. I love it. The GOAT. Hey, Jordan Burroughs is LeBron James, and John Smith is Michael Jordan. Now, nah, get that one out of here. We don't <laughs> like that one. Zeb. I so oh. obviously, obviously, Kyle and I never saw eye to eye. And here's here's another funny Kyle story. Right, we're overseas. I think this is in Hungary in 2018 at the World Championships, and we had gone through the World Training Camp together. I'm out there with Nick. He brought out Mock, I think, actually, as his partner. And uh, we get to the cafeteria one day, and it's just me and him. He comes and sits next to me. He tries talking to me. And I'm like, dude, we like I thought of you every single night going to bed for the last two years, and I was never never able to beat you. So, like, I refused to talk to the dude. And, like, even though we were the only two Americans in this cafeteria at the time, and, and looking back on it, like, I kind of regret it. I've never talked to Kyle. Still haven't talked to him. But, like, he pushed me to be the best version of myself. And looking back on it, I respect it. And I respect him a lot more. Like I had to have such a hatred for him to be the best version of myself. So I still jokingly, people wear uh, the Kyle Snyder rudest shoes to work sometimes. And I'm like, Oh, get that out of here. Like blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, Kyle, if you are listening, if you are watching this, I appreciate what you did and how hard you helped me push myself to be the best version of myself. I wish I could have beat you. I still think, at World Team Camp, uh, Camp Pendleton in 2018 in the summer, I think Coach, uh, oh, I forget who it was, was in our match. I think they screwed me. I think I did beat him in a freestyle match there. I think in front of nobody, I got you in a freestyle match. But regardless, Kyle, thank you for pushing me to be a better competitor and a better man. Okay. Go shoe game for me real quick. Are you – what are you um... – what are you wrestling in right now in NXT? So David Taylor sent me some of his uh, Scrap Life shoes, and I thought that was really cool. So I wear those probably the most, but, I mean, I got a little bit of everything here. Like, let me turn this real quick. Let me I think I, Give me the shoe tour. Yeah, I mean, I got 100 and something pairs here. There's the Scrap Life so, right like, there. That's what you're wearing right now? Yeah, there's the Scrap Life. So there's two rows. I don't know if you can see the oh my God. upper more just... row. So then there's two rows there you... all the way. And then you I got, got a bunch I of aggressors. Bought... Yeah, I always like the aggressors. But then I got like random stuff like combatants thrown in. Like I got these jealous assaults just came in. That was the latest one that I got questioned. This is where I won NXT King of the Weight Room, King of the Grind. Um, these Ooh, are my Oh, dude, Western. look at those. Those, oh. Yeah. So these these were Corellans, and a buddy of mine, Ash Edmond from Illinois, let me borrow these to wrestle Snyder in the first time. And he said, hey, if you beat them, you get to keep them. And then Kyle put it on me. But then he said, hey, you come run a camp for me in the summer, two summers back to back, you can keep them. So that's how I got those. So what would those sell for? Those. What could you sell those for? I, they were Corellans' personal pair, so probably close to two grand, I would guess. I would guess, yeah, like probably 2500 bucks. Pursuit, those are, uh, right? Pursuit. Pursuit twos. I got Adidas equipments up here. Uh, those are the Ali's. I got Dude, this pair of brand new. You're a yeah, 14. 14. Those are KLV twos. I mean, I got the reversals, blue colots, uh, black colots. 
Um, the black hole lots are right here. The Brulons, you call them the Brulons. I like that. Yeah. I got, I got uh, the rest of my Rulons are all. Ooh, let me see those new. Duke Nikes. Let me see those Duke Nikes. Which ones? The Duke Nikes. These ones? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah, oh no, no, no. Those are those are flicker boys, right? Yeah, yep. So I those are the ones I wrestled in and uh Kyle the second time actually. Oh, Bobcats. Jeremy Johnson's. The J train, baby. Yep, those were his. Ga uh, Gavin Spielman got me those. There's my blue P2s that I won scuffle in. I got 54s. Where are all my I got rule ons in here that are brand new. I like these combatants that I got. Uh, take down twos. Did you wrestle? In these, these, you wrestle on a lot of these shoes. Yeah, I I buy shoes. When I buy shoes, I buy them to wear them. There, there's a brand new pair of rule ons. Dude, those um, are worth, those are worth probably eight seven hundred bucks. There's another brand new pair of rule ons. The black and, and yellows though are the more desired colorway. Yeah, I got the I got an orange pair of brand new rule on somewhere too. The only pair that I don't have brand new right now are the uh are the blue ones because I wore them so much in college. But then I mean I got all that stuff here too. Oh my god, dude. Look at you. <laughs> I can't believe you yeah. take that stuff with you. Yeah, I mean it's this is this you'll like this one, Zeb. Well, I like this one. This is me flex <laughs> on for you. This is me, Madison Square Garden. These ones mean a lot. So the Fine Silvers printed these out. It's me coaching them. And like Zach wrote a, a letter with it. So I keep that, keep that in here. But uh, this one is funny. So we went to Wolfpack RTC fundraiser. I'm like, dude, I got to donate some money to these guys. Is that Timmy McCall? Yeah, it's Timmy McCall. Uh, the match to qualify for the Olympic trials, he's got me on my back. I don't end up getting pinned. I end up coming back and beating him in it. But we bought the picture and had him sign it. So I keep it in here. I got the picture of me on my back. Everybody comes in here. They're like, dude, is that you on your back? I'm like, yeah, I think it's hilarious. But you won. I did win, yeah. So <laughs> Pat, Pap Pat Papalizio was the only other guy that would give me a chance uh, coming out of high school. He wanted me to wrestle at State because uh, I reached out to him. And uh, I ended up choosing to wrestle at Duke instead. And I was kind of a, a thorn in his side for the next however many years because I'm like, 17 and 0 against NC State guys. I, I oh, never have lost to an NC State guy. So that was kind of funny. And then the, the other funny story is I showed you the Colots. Um, and then it popped up on the timeline the other day. You remember when he wrestled uh Tion Ware um up in Cleveland and what would have been 2010? Yeah, 10. Yeah, it was 2010 because I had call. public hall. Yeah, public hall, US Open 2010. So I was a volunteer. Uh, me and Mason uh, Doherty or whatever, we were the little kids that would walk people to the mats. Nice. So I had a pair of Colots at the time. I'm like, hey, Mr. Colot, like, would you mind signing these? Like, big fan or whatever. He's like, yeah, I would mind. And just blew me off. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, dang. And then he, he ended up like, we talked about recruiting and coaching and stuff years later. But I, I don't think he ever remembered that story. But my dad pulled me aside because – I took a picture with David Taylor and Kale there. I took a picture with Rulon. And uh, my dad told me after the, the Colad interaction, he said, um, you remember how that made you feel? And if anybody ever wants a picture or your time at some point in your life or an autograph, he's like, you never make a little kid feel like that. But Kerry Colad, he, I realize now he was like getting ready for the finals or whatever. And it probably wasn't the right time and like, you know, everything else. But it always stuck with me that I brought those shoes to get signed by him. Hey, would you mind signing? He's like, yeah, I would mind. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> I, that's a little shocking to me because that guy's pretty cool and actually kind of gets that, I think. So oh, he's the best. I think I, it was he, a he comeback, was, though. I think he was on a comeback, and I, I get it. His around. wife and kids were there. He was yeah, getting ready for the I get it. I did it at the, I was a little kid. I did it at the wrong time. Like, that's on me. Yeah, I, but I will tell you that. this. I will tell you this. Nick Nama, Dolph Ziggler, signs everything people ask him to sign. Takes all the pictures people want with them. Takes people's phones and FaceTimes with their kids when we're at the bar trying to have fun. Uh, gets Does everything people ask of him. Because he says, well, it's not going to always be like that. They want they want your picture now. Why? What, you know, it's not always going to be like this. He understands where he is in the grand scheme of things. And I really appreciate about that guy. And I know his character's like a douchebag or whatever. And whatever is the show off, show steal, whatever. It's like clearly not what he is as a person. You know what I mean? 
Guy would help anybody out. Stay after, help you with whatever you want to be helped with. Give you pointers. He wants everybody to to, to be better people. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, his character might be a, you know a jerk, but the guy's a good guy, and he, he appreciates fans, and he understands that he is where he is because of the fans. Yeah. Oh, he's amazing. He's done a ton for us, and you know we appreciate that both in the business and outside of it. Like I said, like you know, I think one of my biggest saving graces too was you know, to put him over again was living with DC when I was a younger kid, you know, you're younger and more impressionable. I'm living with this guy. He's getting ready for world heavyweight title fight or light heavyweight title fight. The first time he's cutting weight and he's at the grocery store and people would stop and ask like, you know, Hey, can I get a picture? And he always made time for him. Yeah. I always remembered that. And then I remember him winning the world heavyweight title. And I remember, so it's funny. We're flying to uh, Colorado, Northern Colorado to duel them. And I was up on the plane and you're looking out and you know how like sometimes you you start thinking about like life and how big the earth is and how small you are and the, the legacy you leave and stuff like that. And I had one of those like moments. I'm looking over the Rocky Mountains and it's like the world's so big. Like if I could be anything in the world, what would I want to be? And it's like you want to be the heavyweight champion. So you can say at one time walking around this planet, you were the baddest dude walking like Mark Coleman, right? Like yeah. Kevin Randleman, like yeah. It's, it's the coolest thing. And then two weeks later, he calls me, DC. And he's like, hey, they're offering me to fight Stipe this summer. Can you come out? I said, I'm there as much as you need me. So I go out there and I'm, I'm with him, whatever. And a guy that wins the world heavyweight title, I turn around a couple weeks later, he's mopping mats in a, in a junior high wrestling room. Yeah. And then he's mowing his own grass and he's making time for everybody. And like just getting to see that, I don't think I was ever going to be a jerk. But if I ever was going to be a jerk, that was enough to turn me away from being a jerk. You know, like this is a guy who had had everything, you know, the one title that I would want more than anything in the world. And he treated everyone still better than they deserve to be treated. And I'm like, I'll never forget that. Like, I can never, ever repay DC enough for, you know, what he's done for me. I'm hoping I can get him good WrestleMania tickets and hook up Kiki and Dan Dan and Luna and and get him and Selena and all them in the front row at some point at WrestleMania for a real good show or whatever I can be. He taught me a lot too. So I want to plug him, plug Max Roshkoff, a West Holmes guy, my brother through and through, you know, Brad Metz. Those are my guys. The kill buck killer. The kill buck killer. Yeah. He's out in Vegas chasing his dreams. He had the UFC thing, you know, but like, look, look at that dude. You know, the UFC thing fell apart. He called me right after he gets done with it. And he said like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I said, Max, this is what we do. You know, hard times, we push back. He said, I'm tired of pushing, man. Like, life's a marathon, but my legs are tired, basically. I said, like, give it some time. See how you feel. Before you know it, he manned up. He saddled back up. He rode again. And, like, that's what life's about. Like, right? Life's going to bust us all onto our asses. And it's about shaking the dust off, pulling ourselves back up and going again. And, like, that's that, dude. That's It's, it's Brad Metz, you know, a, a kid who was never supposed to do anything. Gives Isaac Jordan a 5-3 state finals match. Goes to Finley, injury after injury, and then ends up All-American in twice D2. Like, you know, those are my guys through and through, like we were talking about earlier. And out of everything, you know, in life, the relationships we formed with those kind of guys, like, that's the best thing. Like, you know, getting on a podcast and and talking to you for this amount of time because, you know, we share that bond and we share those experiences and know the same people. Like, those are the best things in life. I love it. I love it, man. I think we've covered all the bases tonight, haven't we? <laughs> I think so. I think you love your mom and dad too. I think that you plug them a lot too. And your mom <laughs> taught, dad was UPS. I mean, I mean, those I, I can't repay my parents for what they did for me. They did a lot for me, you know. I can't hey, are you an app state wrestling fan though? Well, I mean, obviously. Obviously, you know. Um, why it's transferring out and why it's going to Grand Valley State next year. And really? Then, yeah. And then Ian is, is there. And then, yeah, yeah, I've been an App State fan, yeah, ever since he got there. My first varsity match for Kent State was at App State. We Dude, those dudes are Ooh. tough. John Mark Bentley's got those dudes tough. And they're real tough. They wrestle real hard. He does a lot with a little, and not, not the little that Duke does a lot with, but he does a lot with a little, and they're up on a mountain, and – I think it's a tough place sometimes because the weather's not North Carolina weather, but they figure it out, man. And uh, yeah, I'm an app state fan to answer your question. So I love it, I love it too, man. Um, all right. 
dude, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to cut this off. Shout out to Barbarian Apparel. Go to bar www.barbarianapparel.com. My guy Jacob Casper wears it in the WWE NXT. And uh, check out some singlets. What They got you compression shorts, huh? Compression shorts, yeah. They make my brother's singlets and my compression shorts. So everything they got, I swear by it. Love it. Conquer the Impossible. Thanks for the time. Stick around, Jacob Casper.